So, when I was trying to write this, certainly I wanted to start with the, my, my strong belief that the, the killing of one human being by another is tragic. All such killings are tragic, whether it occurs at a Jewish deli in Paris or outside of a satirical magazine, or whether it's the killing of young black men in our city streets, uh, or the killing of our police officers. All of it is tragic. So I try to think, what could I possibly say that would help heal and not harm in this situation? Well, I decided I'm going to rely on the values that I hold dear to me in ethical culture, the inherent worth of every individual, the importance of social justice, and using ethical relationships to honor worth and to build justice. I figure that if I stay on point there, at least I'll have something to contribute to the conversation that will be positive and maybe relevant to ethical humanists. Difficult conversations certainly work best in my mind when they begin by assuming the inherent worth of every individual. Now out near St. Louis and Ferguson, Missouri, human nature and systemic problems led to Michael Brown's death. I'm not going to go into what happened between him and the police officer. Some of that is still uncertain. But clearly mistakes were made well before Michael Brown stole a box of cigarettes from a convenience store. And mistakes were made well after the police officer, Darren Wilson, shot 12 times at Michael, the last bullet probably taking the young man's life. At least the fact that Michael Brown lay on the pavement for almost four hours is, to me, evidence enough that we do not take the inherent worth of everybody seriously in this country. Staten Island's uh, Eric Garner, whose death was captured on video for everybody to see, was it not accorded the dignity and worth that I expect in a civilized society? I expect you as well. And then what can you say about 12-year-old Tamira Wright? shot by 26-year-old officer Timothy Lehman literally two seconds after the policeman arrived on the scene after getting a 911 call saying that a young man was pointing a gun at a rec center, saying twice on the 911 call that it was, quote, probably a fake. Tragic and unacceptable. And unacceptable the two deaths of the policeman in Brooklyn, Raphael Ramos shot in his car, leaving behind a 13 and 19 year old sons who will never see their father again. Officer Wenjin Liu, who sat beside Ramos and will not be held in the arms of his grieving widow again. But so too, I think, is the tragic suicide of this young and dangerous and troubled killer who shot his ex-girlfriend in Owensville, Maryland, and then drove up to New York to kill those two police officers. He was a product of an environment where revenge, mental instability, way too easy access to guns and crime breeding prisons do not honor inherent worth every day. So if we take seriously our commitment to the inherent worth of each other, every individual, I think we have to be both aware and hold the anguish of those deaths in our hearts. In a world that chooses violence over intelligence, division over unity, and retribution over redemption. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I was impressed with the Muslim Anti-Racism Collaborative right here in Philly, who held a rally. And you heard at the rally the cries you hear in many rallies of I Can't Breathe and Black Lives Matter. But they also tried to include everybody in a circle of love. The Imam Abdul Malik said as following, quote, We have to recognize that all life is sacred, all of its forms, and that the killing of young men and women in uniform is a crime. It's unacceptable and it's evil. And the shooting of unarmed citizens is also unacceptable. I'm not for putting the police against the people and the people against the police. We are all one people. Now the irony of Muslims, what they face in this country, today comes even clearer. <coughs> but building a peaceful society is everybody's work, not just the duty of our police. And that's my main point today. When we get scared, though, we say, we pay our taxes, so you stop crying. That's what we do when we get scared. We retreat. We ask others to step up. We buy home security systems. We watch crime shows. And we vote for tough politicians who turn police into SWAT teams. As one representative of the UN from the Contemporary Forums of Racism and Discrimination Committee said, 
Law enforcement is the screen onto which we project our fears and fantasies of order and disorder. I think that's really true. But we have to take responsibility for the order and disorder in our society. Every one of us here. We have to take that responsibility. <laughs> I'm assuming that's ice. I think so. <laughs> yeah. No, Arnold. <laughs> now, certainly, that is enough to deal with all of those issues of violence, but racism being at the center of the controversy today makes it all much more complicated. And we have a long history in ethical humanism of dealing with race, whether it starts with Felix Adler being one of the two delegates to the 1911 conference on race in, in, in uh, England with W.B. Du Bois, or our historic support of black colleges, or uh, Algernon Black, ethical culture leader in New York, working with young urban youth and serving on the Citizens Complaint Board, or whether it's work that's happening today in Baltimore against the youth prison, or here to reform criminal justice, or out in St. Louis supporting the Ferguson protesters. We have a lot of work that we've done, and we've got a lot more that we've got to do. But systemic racism fuels this current unrest that we're undergoing, as explained by my mentor, Joe Newt Schumann, who is a leader at two societies in the New York area. He says in his article, Racism Endures, the phenomenal incarceration rate of black men, overly zealous prosecution of African American men, disparate sentences for whites and blacks committing the same crime, the presumptions that police have of guilt based on skin color, all speak to the racist character of our criminal justice system. The lack of equal justice has pervaded and continues to pervade the system as it does American society. The Garner and Brown grand jury findings are not exceptions, they are a piece of it. They are a piece of it. These killings led Mayor de Blasio to ask for an honest conversation about race, and look what happened to him. He spoke about talking with his biracial son Dante about the fact that he'll be treated differently because of his color. This was a dad telling a teen an obvious truth in America, to be careful when encountering police, especially if you happen to be African American. On ABC TV, de Blasio confessed, quote, it's different for a white child. That's just the reality in this country. And with Dante, very early on with my son, we said, look, if a police officer stops you, do everything he tells you to do. Don't move suddenly. Don't reach for your cell phone. Because we knew, sadly, that there's a greater chance that it might be misinterpreted if it was a young man of color. Now that's a tragic and undeniable truth, but it provoked outrage from the police union, who criticized the mayor for throwing the police under the bus. Ed Mullins, who's head of the Sergeant's Benevolent Association, suggested that the mayor should move out of the city if he doesn't tr trust his police officers. So that's this us against them mentality that's been brewing more and more out of this controversy and pervades our society. We create enemies and then we attack them, whether it's in the media or with guns. It's the seed and related to our addiction to violence in this society. Again, Joe Schumann points out that, quote, it's emotionally difficult to kill another human being. In order to do so, one has to mentally dehumanize the other and convince oneself that they're worthy of their fate. In other words, one has to construe his victim as the other. My colleagues, Jane, James Croft, watched this othering of people and the virulent racism when he was listening to blogs and comments out about Ferguson, a few miles away from the Ethical Society of St. Louis, where James is an intern leader. So too did Reddit Hudson, who is a former police officer in St. Louis, and he's now head of the NAACP Ethics Project. While he was an officer at St. Louis, he talked about reading racist comments on a website called St. Louis Cop Talk, until the website was taken down because it was so racist. Hudson said that the department was dysfunctional and deeply racist. Now, historic racism led to the creation of a small organization in St. Louis called the Ethical Society of Police, interestingly enough. It was in 1968 when 15 black officers in St. Louis formed this community 
in order to demand equity in recruitment, promotion, and pay. Following the shooting of Michael Brown by Darren Wilson, the St. Louis Ethical Society of Police expressed concern over the low morale of minority officers and the poor management of the department. They shared that, quote, many officers feel insulted with the blatant disregard the chief exhibits towards African Americans. Ironically, the officer who killed Michael Brown, who became the poster child for this indignant defenders of police authority, and the president of the Ethical Society of Police are both named Darren Wilson. <laughs> Two Darren Wilsons, one black and one white, on opposite sides of this controversy. Bizarre. Bizarre. Predictably, around each of these men, circle, wagons were circled and defenders began to crop up. Us versus then came. The Darren Wilson who shot the police officer had very quickly half a million dollars raised in his defense. About half that much was raised for the Friends of Michael Brown Memorial Fund. And I thought to myself, isn't it a pity that we can't raise that kind of money before this occurs so it doesn't happen? So we have this culture of defensiveness and denial about our present problems that's deeply ingrained. Regarding criminal justice, we, have, we resist changes in the system despite these ridiculous tragedies. de Blasio is paying the price for his honesty. Prosecutors recoil at any suggestions that they're partial to or indulgent of their law enforcement partners. And police defiantly resist any attempt to look seriously at charges of wrongdoing or bias. And they reject, certainly, oversight by people outside the departments. Some commentators have talked about the police mentality as being a fortress model the public's told to stay out of police business. Policing is walled off from the communities it serves. And legislators have much more limited access to the police departments, to holding people accountable these days. There are few opportunities, one writer said, few opportunities for local experts, professionals, and other non-political actors to participate in policing. So the relative isolation of the police is creating this exceptionalism and this myopia that doesn't allow the police themselves to see the problems that we're all seeing, the blatant inequality. Hudson, the guy who was in the police department and is now with the NAACP, said, quote, about his fellow police officers, they know there's a different criminal justice system for civilians and police. Even when officers get caught, they know they'll be investigated by their friends and they'll be put on paid leave. My colleagues laughingly refer to this as free vacation. It isn't punishment. And excessive force is almost always deemed as acceptable in our courts and among our grand juries. Prosecutors are tight with their law enforcement partners and share the same values and ideas. Well, the intersection of racism and police power and the separation of the police from the rest of us is a historical creation. And I want to emphasize that because we can unmake it. 200 years ago, the way we police this country began with the rise of the urban core in this country. And after the Civil War, when more poor blacks moved north and more poor immigrants from Europe moved to the big cities, more and more police were sent to the streets of our large cities to try to control the poor, because it was dangerous. So disor dis disorderly conduct and vagrancy began to be the big charges in cities, and people were thrown into jails to keep them off the streets because of the danger of people without opportunity roaming in public. And when the post-World War II recession hit, Policing stepped up even more. And when the civil rights movement stepped up, police movement stepped even further. In 1968, the Supreme Court ruled in Terry versus Ohio that stop, frisk, and search was an acceptable tactic. And courts began to allow police to take more and more of the law into their own hands. Michelle Alexander explains this. Then in 1968, that's also the year she points out that the term undeserving poor began to be used in this country at the same time that the police were beginning to be ramped up. A 1968 Gallup poll indicated that 81% of Americans agreed that, quote, law and order has broken down in this country. And the majority blamed communists, and I quote, Negroes who start riots. Conservatives like Nixon and Reagan began to 
whip up more white resentment and mainstream resentment with terms like welfare queen and criminal predator. And soon, broken window policing became the norm. This encouraged harsh retribution, harsh legal penalties for small infractions. And it was kind of a slippery slope argument that if you don't stop somebody from selling loose cigarettes, then we're going to have plundering all over society. That mentality ramped up as well. So tough on crime political posturing led to mandatory minimum sentences, three strikes rules, and it also limited judicial compassionate jurisdiction. Judges themselves had less capacity to show lenience to individual cases, and it encouraged aggressive police policing. And then on top of that, the courts began removing Fourth Amendment protections. By the way, be careful when you get stopped. So present-day inequalities are linked to this legacy of Jim Crow, to the rigging of the system against people of color, which is why Martin Luther King took to the streets, right? Because the system was broken. So protesters, like today, were told, oh, don't push too hard. Tough on crime demigods, like Bull O'Connor in the 60s or Rudolph Giuliani today, sound very similar when they talk about the people out on the streets, these thugs pushing too hard. They make little distinction between them and the people who shoot police. Janine Theo Harris, who's a SUNY professor in Brooklyn, <coughs> cited Michael Huckabee, one of the Republican candidates for the presidency, supposedly, who said that Ferguson protesters should be, quote, more like Martin Luther King. <laughs> now, he condemned those who took to the streets just because the legal channels had all been broken, right? Huckabee said the following. He said, I'm old enough to have seen mob justice mindset before, from lynch mobs who didn't like the legal process, so they took the law into their own hands. The real heroes of racial injustice were peaceful protesters like Reverend Martin Luther King. Now, I'm all for nonviolence, absolutely. But Theo Harris points out in her article, King took to the streets. He condemned the system. He became a nuisance, just like the protesters who Giuliani and Huckabee are vilifying today. When things get as bad as they are right now for poor communities of color, I agree with Theo Harris saying, quote, there is something, deep, something deeply disturbing and disingenuous about the misuse of King and other civil rights leaders to call for peace and quiet. So in honor of Martin Luther King Jr., I applaud the activists that take to the streets. I urge you to do it yourselves. Join us at the march tomorrow. Maybe get your hair shaved off and protest. <laughs> because we have to be a nuisance in order to change the system, because we're not going to be listened to or we're not. We can't wait for reform to come from within. It has to be across all forms of society. Police around the country now are very diverse. Each department's diverse, so I don't want to take away from the police chiefs and departments who are doing good work to ethically police our communities. On the national level, there is a Department of Justice program called the, the Office of Community-Oriented Policing Services, COPS, and it was begun in 94 as a way to promote community policing. Remember that word? Remember that word, community policing? It was a big deal about 20 years ago. It was good on the surface because it used systemic community partnerships to try to stop crime before it started. It tried to look for ways to talk with each other. Unfortunately, the so-called war on drugs and then the militarization of the police after 9-11 made community policing impossible. Couldn't occur anymore because the trust and true dialogue was no longer at the center of our process. So, so what you end up have, you have SWAT teams going through housing projects, arresting people as part of a cradle-to-prison pipeline for many young people of color in this country. Two years ago, our Attorney General launched a comprehensive re review of our criminal justice system and policing, and it came out saying that we need a lot of reform. I am somewhat pessimistic about how sure that's going to happen from within the system. So what can we do outside of the system? What demands, what specific concrete reforms can we ask for? How can inherent worth and ethical relationships and social justice be a part of our policing? Let's start with this. Let's train our police force better. I hear a lot of things about how policemen have to be armed with the latest equipment when they go into battle. 
But they should also be armed with the abilities and the skill and the confidence to talk to people, yes. to de-escalate violence, mm -hmm. to treat human beings like they're worth something. So it's possible that Eric Garner would be alive today if the policeman there used a mean other than a chokehold, right? I mean, chokeholds have been banned for 20 years as a technique in the New York Police Department. But he didn't stop from using it. Nonviolent communication, respect, and patience can defuse conflicts better. So that's one thing. Body cameras, something the Ferguson protesters have been demanding. President Obama just requested half of a quarter of a billion dollars to purchase 50,000 of these cameras so that a Ferguson wouldn't occur again. Now, cameras in and of themselves are not going to stop these killings. Eric Gardner's case in point. It was being filmed. It didn't stop it. But studies in California show that when cameras are also used in conjunction with telling people they're being filmed, it does de-escalate. When you take that one minute to say, we're being filmed, people suddenly think, oh, there are rules. And people begin to think that they may be held accountable. So it's not just the camera, it's the human interaction. It's the, wait a minute, take a breath. Something is happening here that is going to be universal. So we have to be careful. But clearly, if people aren't held accountable for misbehavior, all the body cameras and all the training aren't going to do any good. So accountability is important. Internal discipline and criminal prosecution of, of police are very rare. Police whistleblowers are brutally treated as traitors. They're passed over for a promotion, they're ignored, they're harassed, they're transferred, they're threatened. We have to stop that. We have to reward the ethical police trying to report this culture of abuse. And until this culture is changed, we have to insist that excessive force cases of the police are handled by special prosecutors. Yes. People outside of the system that aren't dependent on their job, on the support of the police rank and file. The fact that both grand juries in Staten Island and Ferguson did not recommend a criminal trial is worrisome at the very least. Grand juries almost always return a statement that a trial should occur. Bob McCulloch, who was the prosecutor out of Ferguson, I've read a lot about him. At times, he sounded like a defense attorney for the police. Language very different than you'd hear in any other case. Marjorie Cohn, the former president of the National Lawyers Guild, said, quote, the prosecutor did not want an indictment. He passed the buck to the grand jury to make that decision, and it was clear that the prosecutor was partisan in this case. Even when excessive forces cases go to trial, Accused officers are often just transferred, and the victims are given a cash settlement. During Bloomberg's 12 years as mayor in New York, the city paid over $1 billion to settle misconduct cases in the police. Now what? Is, is that justice? Is it justice when 12 years of mayors lead to a $1 billion being sent to police officers, and whose money is it? It's taxpayers' money. It's our money. We are paying for the settlements. There's little to indicate that any change occurs. Quite often, the settlements include gag orders. You can't talk about this anymore. And here's $100,000. Go away. So changes don't occur. When somebody gets hit by a septa bus out here, all sorts of investigations occur. It's all over the news. And then they take lots of procedures to prevent it from happening again. But it doesn't happen inside our criminal justice system. They tried it in the 1950s. They tried to break through this defensiveness and isolation with something called the citizen review boards. But they were all inside police departments. A 1966 report concluded that the New York Civilian Complaint Board functioned quietly and infrequently, handling only 54 cases in 16 years. You're telling me there were only 54 complaints in 16 years in New York City against the police? So that's one reason why John Lindsay, the mayor in the 60s, decided to form the Civilian Complaint Review Board that had civilians who were independent of the police, a voice independent. And he asked Algernon Black, an ethical culture leader, to head that board. And Lindsay's plan included this civilian representation was attacked, similar to today. The president of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association rejected the oversight with a belligerence that's really similar to today. Listen to what he said. 
Quote, I'm sick and tired of giving in to minority groups with their fims and their gripes and their shouting. It sounds like I'm hearing today on right wing radio. This backlash and the warning that you'll be less safe if you don't let us do what we want to do are used to stifle reform all the time because we're scared. In 1969, Philadelphia, citizen oversight basically had no political support and didn't continue. There were bursts of, of, of elements of it. Now, I want to go back and say maybe it's unfair to expect the police alone to reform the system. It's, maybe it's too much that it's only on their shoulders because it's everybody's job. So I think we have to listen to people advocating for broader and more intense types of reforms. So one change is to stop policing from the top down because innovation has to come from the grassroots up. Walls that isolate police from society are ineffective. The idea of community policing was a great idea to leverage the wisdom and buy-in of the neighborhoods themselves to create relationships of trust. And some analysts suggest that broader collaborations, quote, earn the benefit of redirecting police culture from blaming and risk aversion to productive relations among officers and between officers and, su and supervisors. So citizens and victims and potential crime offenders, when they're in dialogue, ethical relationships can grow rather than violence. There are municipal coalitions already, you can read about them in Cincinnati and Boston and San Diego and Seattle, where people are engaged in creating goodwill and, and community resources to change the police culture. That's what community policing was supposed to be about before it got derailed. Leave it to uh, Rolling Stone magazine to suggest an even wilder, more radical reform. They said, consider a police-free world. Okay, maybe it goes too far. But Jose Martin wrote an article saying, police, the title was, Policing is a Dirty Job, but Nobody's Got to Do It. <laughs> and he challenges the typical response of many liberals like me who say, I don't like acceptance of policing, but policing is a dirty job, somebody's got to do it, so I'm not going to get too involved. Martin says in his article that, that reflects a very uncreative, throw up your hands, what are you going to do fatalism. He offers some ideas for a cop-free world. He says, first of all, we should rethink fundamentally our whole criminal justice mindset, because he says crime is changing in this world. I mean, you have changes in internet theft, you have terrorism, you have security technology and video surveillance, and all of those things don't necessarily fit the idea of cops on the street policing. There are different ways that we may have to rethink. We have competing law enforcement agencies that don't know what each other's doing, and big change can occur as well. There was a big change about 100 years ago in this country because over 100 years ago, crime was assumed to be the result of sinful, morally depraved people. That's really how we thought about crime in this country. Until sociologists, social workers began to say, you know what, crime is pretty situational. Any one of us here placed in situations of total poverty and despair without resources and, and uh, ways to approach life might turn to crime. And this view said that crime has to be handled in a community format to eliminate desperation. Same thing with the issue of mental illness. We cut mental services, health services around the country, and then we wonder why people are acting out. New York Rikers Island jails, there's a whole series of them, has more people with mental illness, according to our own statistics, than all 24 psychiatric hospitals in the state of New York. So maybe rather than pouring money into criminal justice, why don't we take the load off the police's shoulders by hiring more mental health professionals and more social workers to help these people live productive lives through social intervention? Yes. Neighborhood mentoring? It's possible to organize groups of people unarmed and trained, many of them returning citizens, to walk the streets of some of the areas where crime is so prevalent with street cred and talk to kids about how they can lead their lives towards successfulness. It happened in Detroit, it happened in Los Angeles, with dialogues going on at the local level, at the street level, at the corner. 
is the part of the film The Interrupters, which I'd like to show here, about a Chicago group called Cure Violence that really did stop crime in one neighborhood. But that's what you gotta do, one neighborhood at a time. In addition, maybe the police should be better educated and paid and respected as professionals, not just civil servants. Jose Martin talks about perhaps we should screen police applicants for bias, temperament, and cognitive skills to minimize risk of encounters with unnecessary, that unnecessarily go bad. Should police be licensed and regulated as we do with other professionals who deal with complex human interactions? Maybe. Because it's not easy being a policeman. Even in more widening circles, crime has to be addressed in the context of a criminal justice system that actually increases crime in this country rather than decrease it. Is it too radical to consider ending incarceration for all nonviolent offenses? Maybe not. Why not place people in home monitoring situation or in mentoring services, especially if they're young people? Don't send a 16-year-old to prison. Obviously, decriminalization by itself is not going to work. Obviously. We need better schools, we need jobs to offer something other than prison as your future. The Department of Justice admits that this change is necessary. Eric Holder's Smart on Crime program a couple of years ago said, quote, incarceration is not the answer in every criminal case. Across the nation, no fewer than 17 states have shifted resources away from prison construction in favor of mistreatment and supervision as a better means of reducing recidivism. That's a very recent trend, by the way, about two, three years. We need to continue that. Less prison construction. What about restorative justice, as used by Mandela in South Africa? Challenging, complex, important. In Philadelphia a few years ago, there were community courts. Anybody remember those? They were supposed to work well. They had some success. They left behind the adversarial model of criminal justice reform, like restorative justice. And it looks to both the victims and the perpetrators to come together and have a dialogue to find some resolution that helps everybody, that heals rather than punishes. So what am I giving you? I'm giving you a, buff a buffet of various potential concrete solutions, rhetorical questions. I want to try to end with a little inspiration. <laughs> so coming up on Martin Luther King Day, I'm reminded that inspiration takes a lot of hard work. It's not something that comes to us like a bolt from above. It requires us sometimes to push very hard. People told King he was pushing too hard, as I said at the beginning. He's, they told him, wait, be patient. He had a few victories in getting to vote for people and tearing down segregation. But he wasn't stopping. And in a less quoted part of his I Have a Dream speech, he said, there are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of unspeakable horrors of police brutality. I've never been a victim of police brutality. I've had the privilege of walking in protests and marches and just down the streets of our cities without worrying about being targeted because of my race. But with that, with that privilege comes a responsibility, an obligation, to make sure that everybody's treated with inherent worth, an obligation to replace power relationships marked by handcuffs with relationships of ethics and words of compassion. It may be inconvenient to demand social justice to block up a street for an hour or two, and it may be, make people anxious. But in order to build social justice, we have to go through tough times. We have to feel some tension. Because King said, peace is not the absence of tension. It's the presence of justice. It's not a short-term project. Many lessons have been learned. I hope our police commissioner here in the city has learned some lessons. He was the DC police commissioner when I lived in Washington. And I know people who were hurt by stupid decisions he made, bad policing. But I hear him saying some things that maybe he's learned, I hope so. I hope he understands as, president, as the president's 
head of the President's Task Force of 21st Century Policing, I hope Ramsey does understand that better schools are needed, that jobs are needed, that gun control is needed, and it requires persistence. This is what Ramsey said just last fall. It takes time. It didn't get broken overnight, and it's not going to get fixed overnight, so you have to keep pushing forward. I hope he does. I hope we do. And as we push forward, we also need to end the culture of violence, whether it results in the strangulation of somebody selling cigarettes, or the assassination of police officers sitting in their cars, or the killing of a 12-year-old who was playing with a gun that we sell at stores and tell him to buy. Well, he was at a recreation center where we tell him to go. This is madness, and it's got to end. It's not something the police can accomplish by themselves. And that's why ethical policing is everybody's business. Thank you.